So guys, I'm going over the last four pages of the final exam review, questions 34 through 60. So here's number 34, principal, uh, a principal of three, a principal who has $300 is deposited, is, is depositing the account, oh, a principal of $300 is depositing an account that pays 6.5% interest compounded weekly. What is the balance after six years? So our formula here is A, okay, let's see if we can get this thing to work here. A, maybe not. Oh, there it is. Okay. A equals principal times 1 plus R divided by N, R is the rate of interest, and then we're going to do N times time. Okay. So let's figure out what all of these variables are. So this is going to be our P. Um, our rate of interest is going to be 0 0.065, because remember we moved the decimal place two places to the left. Uh, it's compounded weekly, so N is going to be equal to 52. Okay and said, what is the balance after six years? So this is our T right here, six, okay? So now we're just going to populate the formula. So A is equal to that 300 times 1 plus our rate of interest, 0 0.065, divided by the 52. Remember, weekly is 52, monthly is 12, daily is 365, semi-annually is 2. So you guys got to keep those things in mind. And then we're going to do our 52 times are six, okay? So what I told my kids is do what's in the parentheses first. So I would do the 0 0.065 divided by the 52, then I would add one to that, then I would take that to the 52 to the six times six power, and then I'd multiply that by 300, okay? So our answer here is going to be $442.99, okay? Then it says use the change of base formula to approximate the following with your calculator. So remember here, when we write this, we're going to write the log of the number that's bigger, um, which is up top, the log of 59049, and we're going to divide it by the log of 3. So you just put that in your calculator, and you get that it's 10. 36 says determine the value of, of the account if the initial investment was $3,000 com compounded continuously. Key phrase right there. So the formula we're using for this is P e to the rt power, right? So the amount is going to be equal to the principal times e to the rt power. So again, here, we got our p right here, and then we've got our interest rate here. So r is going to be equal to 0 0.06 again. t is going to be the 7. So this is going to be equal to our 3,000. And we're going to have to put this in the calculator, e to the 0 0.06 times 7. Let me show you guys how to do that in the calculator. So remember, to get to our E, we're going to do second LN. See that E to the X right there? So we're going to go second LN. Well, actually, let's do this. Clear. We're going to put our 3,000 in there first. 3,000. And then we're going to go second LN. That gets us our E. And then we're doing our E to the 0 .06, 0 0.06 times that 7, right? So we do that, we get 4,500 $65.88. So that was C. All right, then it says expand the logarithm. On this one, remember, whatever's on in the numerator on the top is going to be positive, and whatever's in the denominator on the bottom is going to be negative. So this is going to be the log of 4. And by the way, I see that this is missing something, so this would be log base 3. All of those have a log base 3, okay? So um, log base 3 of 4 plus log base 3 of x squared minus log base 3 of y. Okay, so now what do we know is going to happen with these, the exponent, the x squared? It's going to go out to the front, right? So it's going to end up being there. And we're going to remove it from there. Okay, so which of these answers is the one we have? So we have a log base 3 of 4 plus 2 log base 3. Sorry, I don't know why I put a 3 out front of there. Y'all should have been 2. I guess I'm a little sleepy this morning. Let's do a plus right here, and we're going to put the 2 right there. 2 log base 3 of x, and then minus log base 3 of y. So that is our answer right there. Okay. Then this says find the intercept for the following function. So we're going to go to decimals for this one, okay? So we're going to go 2 to the um, x power, right? 2 to the x power, enter. So it's asking us here um, to find the intercepts for, okay, so it does not intercept the x-axis at all, but it does intercept the y-axis, right? So the intercept's going to be 0, 1, okay? Thus, it's D, okay? 
All right, so if our next one says condense the logarithm. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take everything that's out front and we're going to make it an exponent. We're going to do that first, okay? So this is going to be, um, I'm going to do it over here, log base 4 of x to the 5th plus log base 4 of y to the 3rd minus log base 4 of x, y. Okay, now what we want to do next is condense it. Okay, so we that was the first step in condensing. Now anything that's addition is going to become multiplication. Anything that's subtraction is going to be division. So we're going to rewrite this and we're going to say log base 4 of x to the 5th times y to the 3rd, right, over our x, y. Okay, now you should be able to see that both of those, are, these are both to the first power, right? So we're going to end up subtracting those from the first, from the top, right? So this is going to end up being log base 4 of x to the 4th y squared. Does everybody see that? So our answer to this one was d. All right, find the inverse of the following. So remember, when we do inverses, we're going to swap x's and y's. So we're going to say x equals 6 to the y minus 7 power. Okay, and what we're going to do now is we're going to change this into a log. So the base is the base is the base. So we're going to have log base 6 of what's on the other side of the equal sign. Remember, these two things switch sides, okay? So that's going to be log base 6 of x is equal to y minus 7. Now, aren't we going to add 7 to both sides? Okay, remember, that's in parentheses, right? So this is going to be log base 6 of x plus 7. That's that d right there, okay? So 41 says solve the equation, okay? So on this one, First step is, I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this. 4 to the x minus 1 equals 6. So I'm going to add 1 to both sides. So this is going to be 4x equals 7. And then I'm going to change this to a log. So we're going to say log base 4 of, remember things are switching sides, 7. And that's going to be equal to what? Our x, right? Okay. So we're just going to use the change of base formula here. So we're going to say the log of 7 divided by the log of 4 is going to be equal to our x. So you put that in the calculator, and what you get is a. Okay? 42 says find the inverse of the following again. So we're going to swap our x and y again. x equals log base 3 of our y minus 2. So we're going to add 2 to both sides first because we want to get the log base by itself. Okay, so this is going to be x plus 2 equals log base 3 of y. Now remember, we're going to take our um, denominator and it's going to be our base, right? So we're going to say 3, and the other two things are switching sides again, remember? So these two things are switching sides, so it's going to be log base 3 of x plus 2, that's going to be equal to our y. So y is equal to 3 to the x minus 2, x plus 2 power, right? So it's a b. Okay, let's keep on going. All right, so the next one says, which equation has no solution? So what I'm going to do with a problem like this is I'm going to use Desmos, y'all. Okay, so we're going to go to Desmos. So what I'm looking for here when I put these in is I'm looking for uh, when they don't intersect, okay? So what we're going to do first is we're going to go ahead and put what's on the left as one equation, what's on the right as the other. So I'm, instead of having an M, I'm going to put an X. So I'm going to do X divided by... 5 for my first equation. And then for my second equation, I'm going to do the square root of 12 minus x. Just remember, I can't put an m in there, okay? So, do these intersect? That's what we're looking for. Oh, yeah, they do right there, okay? So, and how many times do they intersect? Um, and it says, which of the equations has no solution? So, this does have one intersection, so it's not a. Let's look at b. So, this one is the square root of negative 14 x plus 2, that's our first equation, and that's on the left. Then we're going to do x minus 3 on the right. x minus 3. Wow, look at that. Those two do not intersect. So I'm going to say that b is our answer right now, but let's keep going just to double check and make sure we got the right one. So the next one, we're going to do 5, and we're going to go to functions here. We're going to scroll down to where we have our whatever root, and we're going to make this the third root. And then we're going to do 4x plus 3. Um, and that's going to be equal to y equals 15, right? Remember, if there's no value over there, then we got to do the y, I mean, no uh, x over there, then we got to do y is equal, equal to. So let's see if these, oh, there are those intersect as well. 
So right now we're thinking it's B, and I, I'm pretty sure it's B, but I'm just going to double check. Remember, I said I'm going to double check just to make sure. And then we've got x plus 18 here, square root of x plus 18, and we got x minus 2. So here again, I can see an intersection there. So the answer was indeed B because it was the only one that had no point of intersection. So again, B it was, okay? Then it says completely solve the following equation for. So there's a couple ways we could do this. We could actually do this mathematically. So I'm going to do it both ways. And I'm going to show you how to do it in Desmos as well. So this is 2x plus 12. So we're going to square both sides, right? To get rid of the square root. So now that's gone. So we have x squared plus 4x plus 4 is equal to 2x plus 12. We're then going to subtract the 2x, and we're going to subtract the 12. So that's going to give us x squared plus 2x minus 8 equals 0. So remember, we're going to factor this. Set both factors equal to 0. So this is going to be x and x. What are the factors of negative 8? That add up to be 2. So that would be plus 2 and minus, wait, 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 minus 2, sorry. x minus 2 and x plus 4, right, because that's a positive. So then we said equals those equal to 0, so this is x equal to 2, and this is x is equal to 4. Now I want to show you how to do this in Desmos as well, okay? So we can put it in just exactly the way the original problem is, y'all. So we can do x plus 2 here, x plus 2 there, and then we can do the square root of the 2x plus 12 here. And what are we looking for again? We're looking for the point of intersection, right? So notice um, I got that the answer was only 2. So what does that tell us about what we saw before? We should have checked it, right, y'all? Okay, so let's go back. So according to what we just saw, 2 was the only answer. So let's go ahead and put 2 up here. So 2 plus 2 is equal to the square root of 2 times 2 plus 12, right? So that's 4 is equal to the square root of 4 plus 12 is 16, right? So 4 is equal to the square root of 16, so 4 is equal to 4. Okay, so that absolutely checks out. So remember, anytime you have a square root problem, you must check it, okay? So we're going to check the other one over here on the right. So now we're going to do the 4. So we're going to do 4 plus 2 is equal to, again, the square root of 2 times 4 plus 12. So this is 6 is going to be equal to, that's going to be 8 plus 12. So is 6 equal to the square root of 20? No, okay? So that one is an extraneous solution. Okay, so remember, anytime you have a square root problem, you must, you must, you must check your answers, okay? All right, 45. A company responsible for making gumballs found that their gumballs had an average diameter of 2.21, so this is our mu, y'all, and a standard deviation of 0.01, so that's our sigma. Um, a store is restocking their gumball machine. In order for the machine to work, gumballs must be between 2.2 and 2.23 in diameter. So that would be our lower bound, right, in our upper bound, okay? If the store uses gumballs mentioned above, using the empirical rule, that means we're drawing it, y'all, what percentage of the time will the machine work? Okay, so we're going to draw our curve over here, and we're going to build it, okay? So in the middle, we've got our 2.21, right? Then we're going to add 1 to that. That's going to give me 2.22 because it was 0.01. And we're going to add another one-tenth, I should say, 100, sorry, 2.23 here. And then I'm going to go left, and that's going to be 2.2. And this would be 2.19, right? Okay. So um, remembering here, and you guys can see this on your formula sheet, this is 34%, this is 34%, this is 13.5, this is 13.5. So now which of these values do we have? We had a 2.2. So that was the line for 2.2 right there. And then we had a 2.23, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to add up all those numbers inside there. 34 plus 34 plus 13.5. Now, if you put this in the calculator, we'd get an answer close to 81.5, but you would not get 81.5. So remember, if it says empirical rule, we are using the drawing. We're going to build the curve, okay? So the next one says, Justin and TJ are servers at a local restaurant. The table below shows their tips they earned. Which student has the lower mean tip for the week and how, by how much? So we're going to do this on the calculator. So to enter a list of numbers, what we're going to do is we're going to go here to stat, and we're going to go to enter. Okay. 
I'm going to go back up here because I already have a list in here. I'm going to clear out the list. Don't delete. Clear. Click Enter. Okay, so now we're going to put our values in there. We're going to go uh, put 62, 44, 65, 44, and 50. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our stat button and we're going to scroll over to calc, okay? And we're going to push enter and enter, enter, enter. This is going to give us our mean. There's our mean right there, 53, okay? So keep that in mind, 53. And we're going to go back to it in a minute, but we're going to go back and put our list in there again. So we're going to go stat again and enter. Again, go back up to the top, clear it, enter. Now we're going to put the other list in there, 42. 38, 61, 44, and 45. Okay, so here again, we're going to go to stat over to calc and enter, and then enter, enter, enter. Now, remember also, sometimes would they want to know about the standard deviation, and it's right there, okay? So our mean here was 50, was 46. So our mean of Justin was 53, and our mean of TJ was 46. So let's go back and put that on. So again, Justin's mean was 53. And TJ's mean was 46. So now let's just read through these statements. Justin's mean tip was $7 less. Oh, well, let's just go ahead and subtract them and see what we get. So that is, uh, yeah, 7, isn't it, y'all? Okay, so it says Justin's tip was, no, that was more. Okay, so that's not true. Justin's mean tip was $6 less. It wasn't 6 or 6, all right? It's got to be C. TJ's t mean tip was seven dollars less yes that's our answer right there okay so remember you also may be asked a question about standard deviation and that would be when you would be looking for the sigma that that's this symbol in your calculator okay and when you're looking for that if, if it's a smaller number it means the numbers are the values are more clustered towards the center and if it's a bigger value it means the values are more spread out okay this one says a product poll number 47 shows skateboards ahead of pogo sticks 52 to 48 so we got skateboards, okay, and then we got pogo sticks, right? So we're going to do both of these. So we're going to do 52 with a margin of error of plus or minus 6, and then 48 plus or minus 6, okay? So when I do that, I got 46 to 58 here, and I've got 42 to 54 Okay, so the easy way to do this is just draw a line, okay, and put these on there. So we've got 46. So our skateboard is going to be 46 to 58, right? And then our pogo stick is going to be 42 to 54, right? So what do you notice here? So you notice that one's there. This one is here. Do you all see the overlap right here? So it says... Um, does the poll accurately indicate which product is more popular? The answer is no. So we know it's not C or D because they overlap, right? So it says 46 to 58 and 42 to 54, the intervals overlap. So the answer is this, no, because they overlap, right? Okay. Remember, when they don't overlap, it, it, we can clearly say who wins, and the person on the right is what's going to be the winner of the situation. Um, the science teacher recorded a pulse rates for each student, each of the students in her class after the students had climbed a set of stairs. She displayed the results by using the box plots shown below. So this one I need you guys to know that this value right here for all of them is Q1. And to the right, this would be Q3. The middle value in there would be the median, okay? And then the, the one on the left would be the, the dot on the left would be your minimum. The dot on your right would be your maximum, okay? So this says which class had the lowest Q1 in pulse rates after climbing the stairs. So remember, everything that we did in uh, uh, blue was Q1. Everything we did in red is Q3, right? So obviously, this clearly shows us that class 1 had the lowest Q1 um, after climbing the stairs, right? All right, the next one, 49. SAT verbal scores are normally distributed with a mean of 450. That's going to be our mu. A standard deviation of 110. Determine what percent of the scores lie between. So that's going to be our lower bound and our upper bound. So we're going to put this one in the calculator. So here we're going to do second vars, which if you notice up above here, it says distribution. And we're going to push number two because we want a normal CDF. Okay. 
So we had our lower bound was 450. Um, our upper bound was 570. Our mean was 450. And our standard deviation was 110. Whoa, 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 wait. I guess I, I didn't change things, y'all. Okay, 450 to 570. And then our mean was 450. Sorry, y'all. And then our standard deviation was 10, 110. Okay, so we're going to click enter, 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 enter till we get our answer. So the answer here is 0 0.3623. Keeping in mind that if this digit over here was 5 or greater, we would round that value up. And if we also, if we wanted to write this as a percentage, we would move the decimal place two places to the right. So let's go ahead and write that. Or on second thought, actually, let's just circle the answer because it's right there. Uh, it's C, okay? The next one says two different company, cable companies, basic channel lineup, and number of employees are nearly identical, but companies vary in their price based on location. So Carter Cable charges a mean monthly price of 85, and that means average, right? So we could just change that to average, um, with a standard deviation of $15. And ADT um, Cable charges customers a mean, again, this is an average, monthly price of $85. Well, they're obviously they're Average is the same, right? So with a standard deviation of five, which of the following statements is most likely to be true? So let's just talk about what that standard deviation means. So the standard deviation of Carter Cable Company tells us that their prices are more spread out, whereas um, AD, AD and T is more clustered together. Okay, so that's going to be important as we start talking through these answers. Carter Company is more consistent with this pricing. I would not agree with that because they have a greater standard deviation. Y'all see this? This is a, a higher standard deviation than this one, okay? So that's not true. B says on average, Carter Company charges more. Well, no, that's not true of either one of these because notice their averages are the same, okay? So that's not true of either one of those. So we're thinking it's C. So AD and T Company Cable is more consistent with this pricing, and that would be true because its standard deviation is lower, okay? All right, so number 51 says an up-and-coming rapper wanted to see what people who downloaded his last album thought about the songs, which best represents the sample. A selection of people who did not want to download the album, every person who downloaded the album, 250 girls who downloaded the album, a selection of 3,349 people who downloaded the album. This one's pretty straightforward to me because obviously this is a census, right? And that's always going to be your most accurate because it's every single person that downloaded the album, okay? Number 52 says, uh, Mr. Winking wants to know how much his students for the year improved from a pretest to the post-test on benchmarks. Which data collection method should he use? So on this one, um, let's just think through this, okay? So it's not, obviously not going to be an experiment, right? Uh, because it's not controlled. Um, it's not a census because he didn't ask uh, um, every single person. It doesn't say anything about that. Um, and then a survey means he took a portion of the people. That's not true either. So this would be an observational study, okay, because he is observ observing what occurred um, and determining the outcome. Number 53 says, given the five summary data set uh, and using the formula Q1 minus Q minus 1.5 times IQR, which data point below would be considered an outlier? So we're going to, on this one, we're going to take find our IQR first. So to do that, we're going to do Q3 minus Q1. So that's going to be 50 minus 26. So that's going to be 24, okay? So then we're going to take, to find our lower bound, we're going to take our Q1 and we're going to subtract from it 1.5 times 24. So that's going to be 26 minus 1.5 times 24. So that's going to be 26 minus 36 which would be equal to negative 10. That would be our lower bound. I don't see any numbers. Uh, 62 is not below that, uh, nor is 17 or 66, okay? So then we got our upper bound, okay? So on this one, we're just going to take Q3, and we're going to add 1.5 times our IQR. We already know what that number is, so we're going to take our 20, our 50, and we're going to add to it the 36 this time, and that's going to give us 86. Again, I don't see any number there that is 
greater than 86, that's our upper bound. So there is no outlier based on the information we're given in this problem, okay? All right, so um, 54 says, which survey question is the most biased or has the most bias? Remember, bias means that either a group of people is either overrepresented or underrepresented in the survey. So it says, in your opinion, what is the most important meal of the day? Explain your reasoning. So this is an opinion, okay? Um, and we want the most bias, okay? Which foods, if any, do you eat that you think might be considered junk food? Uh, you think, I'm going to underline that. Which, would you help a stranger with a broken car, broken down car by giving them a ride in your car? Would you help, okay? And then would you like to improve schools by increasing funding for private schools? Increase funding, private schools. Uh, this is definitely the one, y'all, D, that has the most bias. Why? Because you're asking um, about private schools. So who you survey um, and, and the fact that it says improve schools by increasing funding for private schools, obviously, if you did that, you would only be increasing funding for the people that are going to the private schools. So this is definitely the most biased of the four, okay? Predominantly because there's not a whole lot of bias in the others, okay? So 55 says, Christopher determines the system of S of X and T of X has only one solution. Which system is Christopher solving? So here we again would put this in Desmos, okay? So I went ahead and put both these equations in and I see that they actually intersect at two points. And this one is saying, which system is Christopher solving? If he's looking for only one solution, it's definitely not A. So with B, I want to show you a couple things. First of all, remember when you put an exponent with more than one term up here, you're going to have to put parentheses. Okay, so I got my first term in there for B, and then my second term, it's going to be minus, and then we've got this absolute value symbol right here, so we're going to go ahead and put it in. And X plus 3, and then we're going to go outside that, and we're going to put our plus 2. So here again, it looks like these only intersect, these intersect twice, right? So they're in there, see that? Okay. All right, so then we got our last one, and I'm going to go ahead and enter this one and bring you back to it. It's just actually on second thought. I'm going to go ahead and show you this one too. So I'm going to put what's on top in parentheses because it's going to be easier to enter. X plus 3, close the parentheses, and then divide that by my X minus 5. I could put both in parentheses, but it doesn't really matter with the bottom as much. And then go outside of here and do our plus 1. Okay, so that's our first equation, and then our second one is going to be the square root of x plus 3, and then again go outside of there, plus 2. So notice it only intersects at one time here. <clears throat> and our last one, if you did check it, I'm not going to do it here for the sake of time, doesn't intersect at all, okay? So the first two intersected two times, a and b. This one intersected one time. The last one does not intersect at all, okay? So the answer was c here, okay? So which value to the nearest... 10th is the smallest solution. So here what we want to do is again put this in Desmos and see what is the smallest solution um, to both of these equations. Okay, So I went ahead and put this in um, both of these equations and I'm now seeing that it intersects three times. So there's our biggest value, there's our middle value, here's our bottom value. Okay, So we are looking for the smallest value of x. Okay, So it's going to be the one that's most to the left, so that's going to be negative uh, 1.6 if we round that. So our answer here is B. Then it says a movie theater selling only one size popcorn, one size soft drink. Jason purchased two popcorns and two soft drinks for a total of $23 and purchased three popcorns, two soft drinks for a total of $32.50. How much does a single popcorn cost? So I'm going to actually write the equations for both of these. So we got two popcorn and I'm actually going to do this with X and Y y'all so, so it's a little bit easier for you guys to see. So uh, this is Popcorn's going to be X, soft drink's going to be Y. Okay, 2X plus 3Y, because then we can use the calculator to do this. And that's going to be equal to our $23. We're going to write another equation, which is going to be 3X plus 4Y, and that's going to be equal to $32.50. Now, the way to do this on the calculator or on Desmos is to put both these equations in and see where they intersect, okay? So we're going to do that. So I went ahead and put these in exactly the way they look here, and then we're looking for the point of intersection. So that is the point of intersection right there, okay? So um, the amount of popcorn is $5.50 because that was our X, if you remember, and the amount of soft drinks is 4. So remember, we're going to pull X and Y here if we need to know both. But in this, pro in this problem, it says how much does a single popcorn cost, and it would be $5.50. So that's going to be D for us, okay? So D is the answer. 
I got a couple more, y'all. So Jim purchased nine tickets to a concert, spent $65. He purchased some children's tickets and adult tickets. So we're going to write two, we're going to write two equations. Um, the children's tickets cost $5 each. The adult tickets cost $10 each. So which system of equations below will determine the number of adult tickets, A, and the number of children's tickets, C? So we're not going to use our X, Y this time. And if we had to solve it, we would change that A and that C to X and Y. But for now, what we're going to do is write it exactly the way that they're asking us to. So it says he purchased nine tickets, okay? So this is a total of the number of tickets. So that's going to be A plus C equals nine, right? Let me make that A clearer. Then it also says that he spent $65, right? So um, that means we're going to do the price of the ticket. So we're going to do five times the children's ticket plus... 10 times the adult ticket, and that's going to be equal to our 65, okay? So we've got our A plus C equals 65. No, no. This, these two are right, so that's right and that's right, but then we got to see which one is correct with the rest. 5 times C, 10 times A. So that's not true. This is our correct answer right there, okay? So we've got two more. Determine the solutions to f of x and g of x given the table, the graph below. So what we're looking for here is intersection of the two. So our g of x is a line, where our, as our f of x is two parts of an equation. That's the, the curves, okay? So what we're looking for is where do these intersect, and we're looking for the x values where they intersect, right? So over here, the x value where it intersected was negative 1, and over here it was 1. So our two answers are going to be x is equal to negative 1 and x is equal to 1. All right, so the number 60 says craft toys wagons are made to sell at craft fair. It takes four hours to make a small wagon, X, and six hours to make a large wagon, Y. The craft booth owner has no more than 60 hours available to make the wagons and wants to have at least six small wagons to sell, at least. So that means he wants more than, right? So let's, let's just see how, so this, notice that this, um, small wagons. So this right here is the small wagons. Um, so this is going to be small is going to be greater than or equal to our 6, right? So that's going to be this equation right here. So that means we want to shade everything over here on the right side, okay? Then for the next part, it says uh, it takes four hours to make a small wagon, six hours to make a large wagon. So this is our, uh, the time it takes. That's what this other equation is right here. That's the time it takes to make. Um, and it says the craft booth owner has no more than 60 hours. No more than 60 hours. So that means that if we did our four times the small plus the six times. Actually, let's do Yeah, that's fine. Um, six times. Well, it said use x for the small one, so we'll do it that way. So 4x plus 6y, and that's got to be less than or equal to 60 hours, right? Because it says no more than 60 hours. So that means if we solve this, we would move the 4x to the other side, so that'd be 6y is less than equal to negative 4x plus 60, and then we would divide everything by 6 here. So that would give us y is less than or equal to negative 2 thirds x plus 10. Okay, so there's our y-intercept right there. You see it right here for that equation, and the slope is down 2 over 3. So that's our equation. So now the way to de determine whether a value here is going to be above or below that graph, it says less than, y is less than, but, but the way we test it is to put a point in there, okay? So if we put a point in there, so let's just say we put 4 in there for, no, let's just do 3. So we put 3 in for x. What do we get for y? So negative 2 thirds times 3 plus 10. So that would be, those cancel each other out, negative 2 plus 10. So this would be 8. So our ordered pair here would be 3 comma 8, right? So 3 comma 8, that is a true statement, right? So when we put um, uh, the value in here for y at 3, 8, if we do 3, 8, that would be on our line, right? So that makes it true, okay? And it's to the left. And we could test other points. So we could do 2, 2. So if we put 2 here and 2 here, um, is 2 less than 
negative two thirds plus 10, yes. Okay, so that means we're gonna shade this side of this graph, okay? So now what are we looking for? We're looking for the overlap of the two graphs. So you notice the overlap of the graph was two graphs is right there. That's what we're looking for when we do this, okay? So it says, which of the following is a possible combination given the constraints of the situation? So it says zero large and two small, zero large. So let's just talk about where small and large are. So our x-axis is small, right? And our y-axis is the large, right? Okay. So zero small, zero large would be there and two small would be here. So that would be a point right there. So no, that's not where the overlap is. So it's not A. B says one large. That would be there and two small. So that would be there, still not in our shade, double shaded area. Four large wagons and eight small. So four large would be four here. And we go over to eight there. Yep, that one is within our space over here. Y'all see it? And then eight large wagons and six small wagons. Eight large, six small. That is outside our boundary. Again, it's over here. See it? So we're looking for something that's in our shaded area. So the answer was C, okay? Let me scroll up a little bit, maybe, can't. So our answer was C.